Chapter 6 Desires and the Keys to Modulating Them Always get what you want. If thou wilt make a man happy, add not unto his riches, but take away from his desires. Epicurus, Principal Doctrines As we have seen, living to serve and gratify our desires is far from the key to enduring well-being. But our desires do more than serve as the red herrings of happiness. They actively cause us to suffer. Because desires cause us pain and frustration when they are not satisfied, every desire we harbor is a potential threat to our contentment and stability. Forming defined goals does not get rid of our desires. Even after we refuse the seductive offer of our desires to set our goals for us, they are still present, either serving to pull us toward our goals or away from them. The desires that pull us away from our goals are called temptations. The desires that push us toward our goals are fuel and we will deal with all of these in later chapters. Some desires can be highly beneficial, and we will strive to keep them in place, even amplify and stack them. But this tendency of our desires to propel us toward our goals becomes problematic when we fail to achieve our goals, and the desires for non-existent realities continue to writhe and cause us to suffer. In these cases, previously advantageous desires become disadvantageous, as suffering is rarely conducive to our goals. Popular wisdom offers a solution. Don't fail. Try your best to succeed at achieving your goals, and maybe you won't suffer so much. However, an alternate approach has been suggested by a few wise thinkers throughout history. These thinkers indicate that it might be possible to control our desires directly, rather than simply trying to control our circumstances. They argued that the negative emotions our desires cause can be hijacked, by learning to modulate our desires, we can not only reduce the temptations and increase the fuel propelling us toward our goals, we can eliminate a major source of suffering. In the previous chapter, we looked at how we can modify our perceptions to change our emotions. But if our unwanted emotions are not caused by cognitive distortion, we need to pursue a different path to controlling our emotions. The algorithm which outputs emotions takes in the inputs of cognitions and desires. And if our perceptions are not the problem, we will have to change our desires. Although there seems to be a scarcity of research on the act of changing one's emotions through desire modulation, this practice has been initiated and used successfully for millennia. It has been a major focal point of almost every practical philosophy to date. Most people are familiar with Buddhism's solution to the problem of craving. According to the prevalent interpretation of Siddhartha Gautama's teachings, Liberation from the vicious cycle of craving could be achieved through a combination of mindfulness, ethical living, and wisdom. If followed properly, this path could result in a psychological state potent enough to popularize grunge music for nearly half a decade. Nirvana was a transcendent state characterized by the extinguishment of the fire of craving and desire, a total detachment from preference and outcome. Another wise thinker who weighed in on desire was Epicurus, who argued that we need very little to be happy and should strive to reduce our desires as much as possible. He thought we should satisfy our natural and necessary desires like food and water, but we should not strive to satisfy those which are unnatural or unnecessary, like extravagant foods, sex, power, or Instagram followers. His words, not mine. It is less extreme than the Buddha's suggestion and may strike us as more realistic, and we see this minimalistic approach to desire in countless other thinkers. The sage desires to have few desires. Lao Tzu, Tao Te Ching. I try always to master myself rather than fortune, and to change my desires rather than the order of the world. Rene Descartes, Discourse on Method. Freedom is not achieved by satisfying desire, but eliminating it. Epictetus. Discourses. The Stoic notion that we should not desire what we cannot control is also relevant here. Situations we have no control over are obvious examples of times you shouldn't want things to be different because these desires cause unnecessary suffering. We often long for other things which are out of our reach even though they are not, 
at least at the present moment, within our control. These misplaced longings often result from confusion over how much control we have. No adult suffers over the fact that he cannot simply spread his arms and fly, as this is unambiguously out of reach. There is a condition known as locked-in syndrome in which a patient is fully aware but completely paralyzed, unable to speak, and forced to communicate simple yes or no answers using a computer. Most people will claim they would rather die than have to live this way. The curious finding is that not only is the average quality of life found in these patients very high, but their brains learn to stop struggling with their condition very quickly, often within hours. They cease all desire and strain because the impossibility of controlling the external world quickly becomes unambiguously apparent. The faculty of desire purports to aim at securing what you want. If you fail in your desire, you are unfortunate. If you experience what you would rather avoid, you are unhappy. For desire, suspend it completely for now. Because if you desire something outside your control, you are bound to be disappointed. And even things we do control, which under other circumstances would be deserving of our desire, are not yet within our power to attain. Restrict yourself to choice and refusal, and exercise them carefully, within discipline and detachment. Epictetus in Caridian So Buddhism's solution is to eliminate all desire. Epicureanism's solution is to reduce one's desires to the absolute essentials, and Stoicism's solution is not to desire what we can't control. We will see that each of these perspectives holds keys to the mastery of desire. It is possible for us to regulate our desires such that we cut off our suffering when the situation calls for it. But furthermore, it is entirely possible to do this and still use them to powerfully motivate us towards rational goals. We don't need to renounce desire altogether. We just need to become proficient desire manipulators. If we can tame our desires and develop agility at modulating them so we want the right things at any given time, we can leverage them to fuel us toward our goals as effectively as possible. Later chapters will focus on using our desires to fuel us. But before this can be done, we need to learn and practice the methods these thinkers devised for using desire to promote our own emotional peace. The Modulation of Desire Though they may have viewed the goal differently, a number of great psychotextural thinkers have conceived exercises for strengthening the desire modulation muscle so our wants can be bent to suit our circumstances. Many of these exercises have since been validated by modern research. Each one of these exercises is a counter-algorithm which can be internalized to quash desire-based emotional friction. The first and most basic skill we must practice is the ability to up-regulate, or increase, and down-regulate, or decrease the strength of a particular desire. As the previous chapter described, our cognitions are deeply involved in emotion, and they are intertwined with our desires as well. Strong feelings of desire are typically accompanied or preceded by cognitive simulations and fantasies. Desire-related processing can be subject to a vicious circle of reprocessing and rumination that, in turn, increases the feeling of wanting and the motivational power of desire, the psychology of desire. Participants of experiments who are given cognitively demanding tasks to complete are less likely to respond to stimulus with desire. In other words, if our minds are preoccupied or focused on something else, they are unable to initiate the thought cycles that heighten desire. So the key to basic desire regulation has to do with our mental closeness or distance from the stimulus. This understanding provides us with the opportunity to raise or lower the dials of desire as it serves us. To upregulate a desire, focus purely on the desired stimulus in all of its most positive aspects and delicious details. This can be done to increase the intensity of desire for a school lecture, a long drive, or a veggie burger. We can also downregulate a desire. To do this, distract yourself from the desired stimulus, focus on it in a purely objective, even alienating way, and cultivate a non-attached awareness of the feelings associated with the desire. Marcus Aurelius offers some examples of downregulation. When we have meat before us and other food, we must say to ourselves, this is the dead body of a fish, and this is the dead body of a bird or of a pig, and again, this Falernian wine is only a little grape juice, 
and this purple robe, some sheep's wool dyed with the blood of a shellfish. This is how we should act throughout life. Where there are things that seem worthy of great estimation, we ought to lay them bare and look at their worthlessness and strip them of all the words by which they are exalted. For the outward show of things is a wonderful perverter of reason, and when we are certain the things we are dealing with are worth the trouble, that is when it cheats us most. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations. Buddhism offers a similar exercise for those under the spell of unwanted sexual desire, in which one meditates on the more repulsive aspects of the human body, such as organs, tissues, and fluids, in order to extinguish the fire of lust by removing its fuel. The Buddhist practice of mindfulness meditation in general can be a useful method for taking the subjectivity and passion out of our perceptions and viewing the objects of our desire with dispassionate acceptance. Do not indulge in dreams of having what you have not, but reckon up the chief of the blessings you do possess, and then thankfully remember how you would crave for them if they were not yours. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations There are many methods for regulating desires in bulk. Take the incredibly simple practice of gratitude. Our minds are wired to acclimate to our circumstances and magnify the negative to completely fill our field of view. This tendency may be biologically useful by driving us to continually push for more, but it can destroy our contentment and make life seem like one big series of hindrances and hardships. Gratitude can be used as a method for upregulating all desires for what you already have while downregulating desires for what you lack. It is an excellent strategy for countering the disappointment of failure by shifting emotional investment away from new gains and toward things that you already have, such as loved ones, achievements, or fortunate living conditions. Often the greatest barrier to serenity is too many desires for what we don't possess and too few for what we do. Numerous studies have found that people who consistently experience gratitude are more satisfied with their lives and experience more frequent positive emotions. They are also less depressed, anxious, lonely, and neurotic. Gratitude is likely so effective because it causes people to savor their positive life experiences, reinterpret negative ones, build stronger interpersonal bonds, and avoid constant envy and craving. The Stoics had a related practice, which has been called negative visualization, or pre-mortem. It is closely related to the Buddhist reflection on impermanence, and the Dalai Lama has termed it pain insurance. When you initiate this practice, you reflect on the possibility of losing the things you have. You consider the possibility that all of your plans may fail, all of your possessions may be lost, and all those you care about, including yourself, can and eventually will die. It may seem depressing, but this practice actually goes hand in hand with gratitude. When we down-regulate our desire to possess and keep something permanently, we up-regulate our desire and appreciation for what we have in the present moment. This visualization technique can inoculate us against loss and reduce or eliminate the blow to our emotions we have to bear if things don't go according to plan. This act of anticipating unpleasant events has actually been proven to minimize their emotional impact. In one study, participants were delivered a series of electric shocks of varying intensity. Those who knew the intensity of the shocks in advance experienced less pain and fear than those who received less intense shocks of unpredictable intensity. We can apply this insight by calibrating our expectations so we are never caught off guard by unanticipated shocks. The Buddhist belief called anatta, or non-self, states that the concept of the self is entirely an illusion, and that the person you think you are today is a different entity from what you were 10 years ago, or even 10 seconds ago. You are an ongoing and constantly evolving process, an aggregation of uncontrolled perceptions and cognitions. Non-self serves as a reminder that we are not unified egos, but parts of an ongoing and constantly evolving process, an aggregation of uncontrolled perceptions and cognitions. We are not discrete beings detached from all others, but inextricably tied to the collective of all sentient beings. Much of the pain we experience is caused not by events we wish to avoid, but by the identity we wish to have. The desires which cause us to suffer when we are hit with a painful insult are the desires to be a competent, lovable, and valued individual. But by contemplating non-self, we can down-regulate all identity-based desires by reminding ourselves of the flaws with the entire self-construct 
when circumstances clash with these desires to be liked or respected. There is evidence that reflecting less on our personal life narratives and more on the expanded self improves well-being. A decrease in narrative self-thoughts has been found to result in greater well-being by decreasing negative and mixed negative positive emotions. This decrease in attention on the self is often achieved and studied through a practice of mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness is thought by some to have this effect by decreasing activity in the brain structures collectively known as the default mode network, which are associated with rumination about the narrative self. The Stoics also made use of a method known as the view from above, which consists of contemplating the vastness of the cosmos and the contrasting smallness of all of one's petty concerns. This method can be used to downregulate all of your desires in bulk when you are overly invested in general, particularly when life becomes volatile. To see them from above, the thousands of animal herds, the rituals, the voyages on calm or stormy seas, the different ways we come into the world, share it with one another, and leave it. Consider the lives led once by others, long ago, the lives to be led by others after you, the lives led even now in foreign lands. How many people don't even know your name? How many will soon have forgotten it? How many offer you praise now and tomorrow, perhaps contempt? Marcus Aurelius, Meditations. It is hard to even read this quotation without feeling a humble relief over the ultimate triviality of our concerns. The Stoics thought the primary reason we suffered was because we were unable to comprehend and love nature in its entirety. When we understand that everything that happens is causally determined, we free ourselves from the blame and resentment of ourselves and others, and from the anxiety of trying to control fate. When we come to see that what we naturally view as bad is derived from our limited perspective, we can put a limit to our sadness. And when we understand that the permanence of our possessions, relationships, and souls for which we long is unattainable, we can learn to love what is permanent. Viktor Frankl, a 20th century psychiatrist famous for his analysis of his own experiences as a prisoner in Nazi death camps during the Holocaust, notes the utility of the distancing tactic. All that oppressed me at that moment became objective, seen and described from the remote viewpoint of science. By this method, I succeeded somehow in rising above the situation, above the sufferings of the moment, and I observed them as if they were already of the past. Both I and my troubles became the interesting object of psychoscientific study taken on by myself. Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning. In his book, The Philosophy of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, Donald Robertson points out that this thought experiment has its place in modern therapy as well. Aaron Beck refers to the tendency of depressed patients to magnify their issues and take the worm's eye view of their situations. To counter this, patients are encouraged to take an enlarged perspective, in which they distance themselves from their current circumstances, view them with greater objectivity, and contemplate them from a greater scale and time span. Let's return to our video rental rejection example from the previous chapter. Let's say you have mastered the art of cognitive restructuring and have no distortions in reasoning around this rejection, but somehow the rejection still causes you to suffer. The conflict between this reality and your desire for the job results in sadness. You know this job is already out of the question for you, but a rogue desire within you is causing you to experience emotions that aren't serving you. It would be much better if your desires were fully adapted to this reality so they could start fueling you toward a better outcome instead of causing needless pain. So let's get rid of that useless desire. You can use desire modulation to adjust the dials of desire and calibrate them to reality. You could engage in gratitude to upregulate your desire for all the great things you have, even if this particular job isn't one of them. You also might downregulate the specific desire causing your suffering by reminding yourself of the hour and a half long commute, or that movie rental is probably not a great industry to build a career in right now, or that you have a master's in data science. Honestly, I have no idea what you saw on that job in the first place, Sarah. Once you learn and strengthen your ability to use these tactics, you will be able to adjust your desires at will, largely eliminating the tendency to suffer over ungratified longings. The Counteraction of Desire Greed and aversion surface in the form of thoughts, and thus can be eroded by a process of thought substitution by replacing them with the thoughts opposed to them. Bhikkhu Bodhi 
the Noble Eightfold Path. A powerful tactic which uses and builds upon the basic skills of up and down regulation is a method I call counteraction. Counteraction, which was briefly touched on in Chapter 2, entails balancing out a desire by up or down regulating an equal and opposing desire so they cancel one another out. Have you ever sat at a red light full of anger that it's taking too long to change? Of course you have. Have you ever been frustrated that a red light changed to green too quickly? perhaps because it interrupted your attempt to eat a sandwich or shave your legs on your commute? In this conflict, there is an opportunity. Next time you are sitting at a red light impatiently, try cultivating the desire for the light to stay red as long as possible. Use the upregulation techniques listed above to desire the opposite of whatever is nagging at you. By generating conflicting desires, you hedge your bets against unwanted outcomes and turn every outcome into a wanted one. The moment one outcome actualizes, you can drop the counteracting desire. If you can develop the ability to neutralize all of your desires, you can then upregulate and downregulate them precisely in order to achieve the goals which align with your ideals. You can carefully increase a desire and decrease the conflicting desire, like increasing the gas in a car. Eventually, you will start to enact counteraction techniques automatically and internally you start to immediately notice friction in your mind and generate the counteracting desire automatically. As we will explore in the behavioral section, desires operate algorithmically too, meaning they are based on habits and can be programmed or deprogrammed. Eating ice cream after every meal will cause you to strongly desire dessert after every meal. Watching television every day after work will cause you to need to watch television every day after work. And struggling with every setback in your life, desiring reality to be otherwise, will cause you to continue to struggle. Some of our desires are not for isolated objects, but represent ongoing dependencies from which we may aspire to free ourselves. Because we are creatures of habit, our behaviors have a strong influence on what we become. This is why, even though there is no biological reason for pieces of green paper and numbers in our bank account to capture our desires, we can be trained to crave money. Weird as it may seem, we often learn about ourselves by observing our own behaviors, so if all of our behaviors suggest to us that money, for example, is the highest good, we very well may start to believe it. One of the lesser known and more fascinating of the ancient Greek philosophers was a man known as Diogenes of Sinope. He is thought to have lived partially naked in a wine barrel in Athens, and to have frequently relieved and pleasured himself in public. According to one revealing story, Alexander the Great became dismayed that Diogenes had not come to visit him, as many others had come to lavish him in praise. So Alexander decided to pay Diogenes a visit, accompanied by a large crowd and trumpets and announcing his arrival. Alexander greeted and praised Diogenes, and said, Ask any favor you choose of me. After leaning up a bit and seeing the crowd of people, Diogenes told the leader of the civilized world only to stand a little out of my son. Diogenes may sound like a senile, homeless man, but he was actually a highly respected philosopher and founder of the school of cynicism. He was admired for his wit and radical nonconformity. And though eccentric, he had surprisingly coherent reasons for his behaviors. He engaged in inappropriate acts in public because he believed anything natural and acceptable to do in private should be regarded as acceptable in public. He chose to live in poverty and rejected praise and favors because he held wealth, social status, and all cultural values in contempt. He was a precursor to the modern-day minimalist, rejecting anything unnecessary. His shamelessness was meant to serve as a demonstration that nature and reason were superior to convention, and that in many ways, The simple lives of animals were better than the overcomplicated lives civilized society demands. He preached the virtues of self-control and self-sufficiency, and claimed that virtue of character was all anyone needed to live a good life. He once threw away his only possession, a wooden bowl, after seeing a boy cupping his hands to drink from the river, announcing, A child has beaten me in plainness of living. Diogenes is probably not someone you will want to model your life after, and the fact that he was a great philosopher does not make the case for disregarding hygiene or social courtesy. But his life is a reminder that many of the things you may consider essential for a happy life can be discarded without losing your sense of peace or purpose. 
By banishing all unnecessary forms of gratification from his life, he reduced the number of things he needed to have in order to be content, and the number of things he could lose that would ruin his day. If we find that certain desire-based dependencies are maladaptive or cause us to act against our values, we can use the practice of asceticism, or voluntary discomfort, to intentionally deprive ourselves of some desired and attainable object. The practice has been used by some to serve as self-punishment, which has led some to quickly write it off. But the useful purpose of asceticism is to downregulate a perpetual desire for anything extrinsic. By utilizing this practice, you can break dependencies and make yourself more emotionally robust. Simply choose something on which you feel you are overly reliant and intentionally limit or sacrifice the gratification of the associated desire. Though it may feel like self-punishment, minor and temporary acts of self-denial can be fully grounded in self-compassion. If you find yourself unable to endure basic economy flights, enjoy camping trips, or are unhappy whenever the thermostat is not set to the perfect temperature, you have become overly reliant on comfort. This dependency will limit your ability to be content in all but the rare perfect scenario. In this case, you can periodically force yourself to endure pain or discomfort to downregulate the desire for comfort. Counter your dependency by sleeping on the floor for a night or walking barefoot on a gravel road. Taking this to its extreme and hiking the Appalachian Trail will completely rewire your relationship with comfort. If it is pleasure you crave, you can temporarily deprive yourself of food, fasting, sex, or a drug to downregulate the desire. Minor acts of social sacrifice, such as neglecting an opportunity to signal something positive about yourself, can decrease your desire for status, approval, and validation. And giving away all but the most necessary possessions in the spirit of minimalism can downregulate the innate desire to accumulate and hoard. You can even take this ascetic spirit to an extreme by completely renouncing some forms of desire. You can refuse to accumulate new toys. Reject all social media platforms. Commit to give away all excess money beyond what is needed for a sustainable lifestyle. For every type of perpetual desire you are able to renounce, you remove complication from your life. Frequent practice of moderate asceticism is a way of embedding into your mind the fact that your desires are not good indicators of worthwhile choices. When you act against those desires, your mind will learn from your behaviors and conclude that these things are not so desirable after all. Would anyone who thought pleasure was the ultimate good deliberately put herself in an uncomfortable position? Would anyone who thought social status were the highest good neglect his social media accounts? Would anyone who thought money were the highest good turn down or even give away a large sum of money? You teach yourself what is important to you through your behaviors, so behave wisely. Learning the ways of your desires and strengthening the skill of modulating them will require patience, but once you have done this, you will be able to use this craft in real time. When an obstacle stands in your way, you will instantly arrange your desires to avoid the emotional friction and focus your attention on responding to the obstacle. Principles of Modulation On a broader level, there are principles we can follow for relating to our desires and working with them more effectively to avoid unnecessary pain. You need to detect when you want something very strongly, when there are few alternates to a particular object or outcome. Ask yourself, What would cause me to suffer if I failed to achieve it or lost it? Maybe failing out of college would crush you, or perhaps the loss of a favorite pet. Though we may not be eager to plan for these misfortunes, doing so can prevent us from being blindsided if and when they occur. Let's look back at the goal hierarchy from before. We saw that defined goals are the keys to actualizing your values, but they are also the key to reducing suffering. When we aim for the intrinsic, we will be much less likely to suffer because nothing can take out our final goals. Modern Stoic William Irvin illustrates this by looking at the goals of a tennis player. Thus, his goal in playing tennis will not be to win a match, something external over which he has only partial control, but to play to the best of his ability in the match, something internal over which he has complete control. By choosing this goal, he will spare himself frustration or disappointment should he lose the match, Since it was not his goal to win the match, he will not have failed to attain his goal as long as he played his best. His tranquility will not be disrupted. William Irvin
a guide to the good life. Intrinsic goals do not result in negative emotion because it is impossible to fail at them, and building a life full of intrinsic goals is a great way to prevent constant emotional pain. But even when our highest goals and ultimate aims are intrinsic, we will inevitably have certain extrinsic sub-goals that will result in pain when they are unmet. And in order to prevent this pain, we need to structure these goals properly. If you have only one goal that will satisfy you and a long chain of sub-goals needed to reach it, you will be highly vulnerable to unexpected blows. But if you can build a diverse hierarchy of goals, sub-goals, and alternates, you can be far more emotionally robust. As soon as one goal fails, you can pivot over to another, and the more quickly this can be done, the less time you have to spend suffering, and the sooner you can get back to pursuing your ends. This is why you need to develop alternates for your goals. Carve out as many alternate paths to your higher goals as you can. If you desperately want a particular job at a particular time, you will be crushed if you fail to land it. Try to discover other companies and timelines as paths toward a fulfilling job. On a higher level, add the alternate goal of starting a business as a path toward income. Why not take it to the extreme? Develop the alternate goal of living in a monastery as a path toward a sustainable existence. Reflect on the possibility of building a new life with new opportunities for growth after a major loss. Our desires are essentially emotional investments, and many of the principles of good financial investing apply to good desire allocation. Diversification is the act of increasing the variety of investments to avoid being overly reliant on any particular one. Just as being fully invested in one stock makes you incredibly vulnerable to its fluctuations, being fully invested in any specific goal or outcome makes you emotionally vulnerable. Whether you find yourself attached to a belief, an idea at work, a way to spend your Saturday, or a person to spend the rest of your life with, failing to cultivate positive alternatives will leave you crushed when things don't go according to plan. You should set up your desires such that you benefit from every possible outcome. Design a dense minefield of success for yourself, such that it is impossible to take a step without winning. Use the tactics discussed earlier to upregulate or downregulate desires until all outcomes are appropriately balanced. Invest desire toward the goals with the highest and most probable emotional return. When it seems likely that a certain goal will not pan out and its outcome is out of your control, downregulate your desire for that outcome or counteract it with an opposing desire. When you suspect that a person in your life has an overall negative effect on you, decrease your investment and increase it in other, more constructive relationships. Furthermore, if you feel you are overly invested in relationships altogether or have a condition like autism that makes relationships more difficult, it may be a good idea to shift significant emotional investment toward other things, such as creative pursuits. The investment principle of liquidity is also highly relevant to desire design. You need to be able to quickly move funds from one form of investment to another so you can respond to new circumstances with agility. And you need to be able to modulate your desires quickly so you aren't stuck wanting something which has already left the realm of possibility. By exercising the muscle of desire regulation, even when it seems unnecessary, you increase your emotional agility. Try to take a relatively weak desire and ramp it up to a strong craving. Try to take a desperate longing and reduce it to indifference. Lastly, extinguish desire for anything out of the realm of possibility as quickly as possible. It wouldn't make sense to invest in the stock of a company we knew was going out of business, and it doesn't make sense to invest emotionally in a dead end. The stoic contrast between circumstances we can control and those we cannot becomes highly relevant here, and the most common of such outcomes, one we can absolutely never control, is one that has happened in the past. As you get quicker and quicker at desire regulation, you increase what we might call your refresh rate, or the speed at which you can accept and adapt to circumstances. You gain the ability to adjust the dials of desire as it aids you in your goals, whether those goals are behavioral or emotional. Much like the reappraisal methods of the last chapter, this can become an instantaneous process. You can adapt to new circumstances as soon as they arise and skip the negative emotions altogether. You will know you have mastered desire when you are capable of desiring whatever comes your way. 
Your car's battery dying becomes an unexpected adventure in an otherwise boring day. A difficult transition in life becomes an opportunity to learn and grow. Some people like to point out that without desire, we would all be apathetic and passive observers of reality, never finding motivation to achieve our goals. This is true, and that is why, rather than eliminating desire, we need to design our desire structures carefully. With practice, you can learn to desire for the present to be exactly as it is, while desiring for the future to be different. It is no accident that we are covering how to use desire modulation for tranquility before we learn to use it for effective motivation. If you lack the ability to stabilize your emotions and feel at peace in the face of difficult circumstances, those emotions will hijack your plans to achieve bigger things. The founders of other practical philosophies have lifted emotional control and stability to the level of the highest human goal. For us, the ability to remain tranquil and content in spite of our circumstances is not the highest goal in life, but an essential instrument for aligning with our values and living a great life. 